Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you at this time, God, this once again, we want to magnify you and your holiness. And God, considering the God that you are, um, who are we that we could enter into your presence, that you would bother coming into our presence? But your word gives us the answer to that question. Is your son. It is what Jesus did for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. That he has taken away all that which separates us from you and and he has brought us into your family. And Father, we're thankful that you are a God who's revealed himself to us. And you are a great God and you are beyond our comprehension But God, here on this side, we're learning bits and pieces about you. And we thank you for these times when we're able to gather together as your children and open up your precious word without which we could not know you anything like we do. So we would ask that as we look into your word this morning that you would help us maybe um, just to grasp a little bit more about you. But mainly, God, um, just to um, be reminded of who you are and um, to cherish you and and look to you for all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of this morning's message is Handling Challenges. Life is filled with challenges and struggles. Sometimes challenges are new opportunities, sometimes they are hardships to bear, and they come in many shapes and forms. Sometimes those challenges are major medical issues, where there's surgeries and treatments and medications. Raising children is a challenge, amen? Amen. You know, and most of the time with people, it is your own children. But sometimes for others, it's grandchildren, nephews, and nieces. And maybe this morning, you're a single parent. And that comes with its own unique challenges. Work has its challenges, the responsibilities, the relationships with people there. It can be very challenging. Some struggle with addictions. There are challenges um, in standing for Christ on secular college campuses or maybe a worldly work environment. And the list can go on and on with challenges that we face in our lives. Well, this morning we are beginning a new series from the book of Joshua. And I believe that Joshua contains wisdom for dealing with these challenging times. So if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn to the first chapter of Joshua. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9 this morning. Um, Most of the verses that we'll be using are up on the screen. Some are not, though. And so you may need your Bible if you want to check up on the preacher. And you always want to check up on a preacher, you know, to make sure that what he is saying is true to the Word of God. Joshua chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. It reads, Now it came about, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, Cross this Jordan and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, 
And as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. For me, verse 2 is a two by four between the eyes. Moses is dead. Moses was special. He led the Israelites for 40 years. He was God's instrument for doing the mighty miracles that served to deliver them from slavery in Egypt and provided for them on their journeys. At Mount Sinai, Moses received from God's hand the system of moral, civil, and ceremonial laws that governed the nation Israel. Now they are to take possession of the promised land, and they know that its inhabitants are not very fond of that idea. How are they going to deal with that without Moses? With all that he has been and all that he's done for him, and he's gone now, and yet all that still remains before them. Well, God says, Joshua, you are the next man up. Talk about big shoes, or maybe we should say big sandals to fill. I mean, put yourself in Joshua's sandals. Are you excited or are you scared to death? Maybe a little bit of both. My first thought is if it was me, I'd be thinking, lead those people? Well, before we get into the move into the land, I'm going to give us um, some background of the book. How did they get to this point? Well, first, God chose a man. In Genesis 12, verses 1 and 2, God spoke to a man named Abram. And he said, I will show you a land and I will make you a great nation. Abram knew nothing about the God of heaven. There was nothing special about Abram, but God chose him. God chose Abram and the nation which would come from him. Secondly, God promised land. Abram and his family followed God to the land of Canaan. And in chapter 13 of Genesis, the Lord said to Abram, Lift up your eyes and look. Northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. According to Genesis 15, 18 and Joshua 1, 4, The land extended from the Nile River in the south to Lebanon in the north to the Mediterranean Sea in the west and to the Euphrates River in the east. Some have estimated that this was a territory of 300,000 miles, square miles. God said that this land would belong to Abram and his descendants forever. God said, Deuteronomy 30, verses 4 and 5, even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it. Jeremiah 31, verses 35 through 37, God declared in that passage that as long as the sun gave light by day and the moon and stars by night, Israel would never cease to exist. Though the situation in the Middle East is crazy right now, God will take care of Israel. God promised him, chose Abram, said, I'm going to give you this land. God meant what he said. 
In Genesis 15, 9, God told Abram to bring several animals, to cut them in half, and to lay the pieces opposite one another. Then God gave Abram a dream. And in his dream, Abram saw a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which he recognized as being God. And God passed between those animal pieces that had been laid out earlier. In that day, two parties used this ceremony to signify their commitment to the covenant they made with one another. And both of them passed between the pieces, each one of them saying to the other, by that act that I am committed to this covenant that I have made with you. But in this case, in his dream, God alone passed between the animal pieces. Not Israel, not a representative of Israel, only God. God was saying by that that he would make Abram a great nation and give the nation land regardless of what Abram and the nation of Israel would do or not do. God was making an unconditional guarantee. God meant what he said. Number four. God in this, in the background we're looking at, God overcame man's sinfulness. At Kadesh Barnea, 12 spies entered the promised land. Forty days later, they reported that the land was fruitful and very rich. But ten of the spies said that the occupants were too strong for the Israelites to de defeat. Joshua and Caleb, the other two spies, responded, God will enable us to take this land. Well, the people sided with the majority. The majority is not always right. But they sided with the majority and they refused to follow the Lord. And God judged them. And every adult had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they died. Every adult except Joshua and Caleb. By the end of the book of Deuteronomy, God has brought them to the entrance of the land again. And God directed at that time a transition of leadership. God would not allow Moses to enter the promised land because he had disobeyed God at Meribah. Moses died, never having entered the promised land. And he was buried on Mount Nebo on the outskirts of the promised land. God made Joshua to be Moses' successor. Joshua had been Moses' right-hand man from the beginning. He saw God's power displayed on many occasions. He had led Israel's military in battle against the Amalekites shortly after they left Egypt. He was with Moses on Mount Sinai at Kadesh Barnea. He had demonstrated faith in God. And now God calls him to be the leader of the nation. He and the people have mourned Moses' death for a period of time. And now God says, get up and lead this people across the Jordan. How was Joshua to do this? Short answer, with God. With God's help. God is sovereign. God has been in control from the beginning to this point. Calling Abraham, leading them through the journey, carrying them to Mount Sinai and all the rest. God has been there and God is still there. He will bring his will to pass. But God's sovereignty does not exclude man's responsibility. Philippians 1.6, for example, says, 
The God who began a good work in you will complete that work. He is sovereign. But the very next chapter in Philippians says, you are to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. God will do, God will work, but Joshua has responsibilities. In our challenges in life, God is sovereign and God is at work, but there are responsibilities still that we have in those times. And that's what we want to talk about from Joshua chapter 1. The first responsibility that he had, that we have, is to trust God's promises. God said to Joshua, I have given you the land. Verse 3, I have given you every place on which the sole of your foot treads. Kind of interesting to me that it is past tense. I have given it to you. It's as good as done. Promise though, I'll give you the land. Second promise, I will give you victory over the enemy. And that promise did apply to the future. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. God gave them the land and the victory when he swore to the fathers. He promised Abraham, Abram. He also promised Isaac and Jacob. It is coming to you. The land is going to be yours. You're going to overcome those people that are in that land. And I will be with you was the third promise. That's kind of like for past, present, and future. God is always with his people. Verse 5, he said, Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. And I will not fail you or forsake you. The promises that God made to Joshua. Joshua, you need to trust my promises. What are some promises that he has made to you as you find yourself in the midst of your particular challenge? Um, I've got um, Philippians 4, verse 13. Anybody know what Philippians 4, 13 says? If you could not hear a number of quoting. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A few verses further in verse 19, Philippians chapter 4. What does that verse say? Not as, not as common, is it? It says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. There's another promise. Another promise in Hebrews 13, 5. Same one he gave Joshua. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will always be present. Do you trust God? Second question, do you worry? You know, full trust and worry is mutually exclusive. If our trust and our faith was 100%, there wouldn't be any worry. But, granted, it's not any of us. But Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 speaks to that. It says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't it interesting? You're praying. What are you praying about? Well, obviously, um, I've got something that I'm concerned about and I'm praying to God. And, but then he's, when he's praying, he's praying with thanksgiving that God he knows God is at work in this particular situation. And God is going to work things out. But I got a question. Where does faith come from? Where does trust in someone come from? I believe that trust is built upon relationship. 
whether it be with people or whether it be with God, the level of our trust oftentimes is directly proportional to the level of relationship that we have with them. There are some people you wouldn't trust with a nickel. And there are other people that you would trust with your life. And the difference is the relationship that you have with those people You know this one's not trustworthy, but you know that this one is, and you've established that relationship. And we should trust God with all things, but do we have the relationship with Him that brings us to that point of surrendering all to Him? So what we need to be concerned about is strengthening that relationship with God. How do we go about that? I find it interesting here that God gives a second, and I I call it a promise also. It's a command, but I think it also has promise within it. God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Three times this commandment, this promise is repeated. That tells me it's got to be important. Verse 6, verse 7, and verse 9, we find these words spoken. But how's it a promise also? Well, first off, be strong. Be strong. As I, as I did some study of this word, this, this Hebrew word is translated strong, but it also carries the idea of binding fast to, of holding to. When he says be strong, he's talking about binding yourself to another, holding fast to another. And that other, obviously, is the Lord. The meaning of this word is pictured in Ecclesiastes 4.12, which says if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. In other words, strength comes from togetherness, from binding ourselves to the Lord, of entwining our lives with the Lord. How deep is your relationship with the Lord? The depth of that relationship determines the strength of your faith in going forward. Be strong. Be strong. Secondly, Be courageous. Wilson's Old Testament word studies states that when combined with the previous word, strong, this word denotes fearlessness and a resolute mind. No fear, but firmly resolved in moving forward regardless of the circumstances. James 1.6 says it is the relationship of faith that keeps one from being driven and tossed by the winds of this life. Maybe you've heard the saying, no God, no peace. No God, no peace. But I've got no God, no fear. No God, no fear. Okay? The great reformer, Martin Luther, suffered with depressive episodes through most of his adult life. One time, when he was feeling very defeated by life, his wife, Catherine, dressed up in widow's garb and began to mourn deeply. When Luther asked her why why she was crying so, she told him that she mourned because she had gathered from his behavior that God must have died. Luther smiled. He got the message. His faith returned, trusted the Lord. 
Joshua knew the Lord, but he needed to know the Lord more deeply, just as many of us, most of us, maybe all of us, know the Lord, but we need to know him more deeply. How do we get to know the Lord more deeply that in turn it would strengthen our faith? Third point, value God's word. Value his word. You know, Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, granted, that particular verse applies to unbelievers, but I believe in another sense it applies to believers also. Joshua was to do three things in regards to the Scripture. Verses 7 through 8. Um, <clears throat> he was to talk about it. The law was not to depart from his mouth. Verse 8. He was to think about it. He was to meditate on it day and night. Verse 8. He was to obey it. To do according to everything written in it. Verse 8. The psalmist declared in Psalms chapter 1 verse 2 and 3. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Which yields its fruit in its season. And in whatever he does he prospers. Joshua was faced with an enemy that could, would do all that he could to destroy Joshua and his people. And yet God doesn't talk to Joshua about military tactics, about battle strategies. He doesn't start by giving him a plan of attack. Instead, God talked to Joshua about his heart. God wanted Joshua and us to know that the key to overcoming the challenges of our lives primarily is spiritual and not managerial. The strength for overcoming is the Lord. The Lord who is revealed in the Word of God. So, how do we receive God's Word into our lives? There's an acrostic that I was exposed to that um, I believe answers this question. Um, you know, the psalmist said, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Five ways that we can receive God's word into our lives. The H stands for hear, which is what you're doing this morning. You're hearing God's word. You're listening to God's word. The E is examine God's Word, or you could say it's the same thing as reading God's Word. It's the surface reading of God's Word. The A stands for analyze God's Word, to study God's Word, which is going deeper than simply reading God's Word. There is the R stands for remember the Word, to memorize the Word. Now hear me in this. Most, most of you here this, this morning are a good bit younger than I am. I want you to know that your best chance of memorizing God's Word is in the time of your life right now. You need to start your children right now in memorizing God's Word. Because the time is going to come when you discover that I am forgetting more than I'm learning. It's just the brain. It's just these corrupt bodies that we have. Hide God's Word in your heart. Memorize God's Word. And then after you do that, the T stands for think upon God's Word. To meditate upon God's Word. To think about it. To let it run over and over through your mind. H-E-A-R-T. Um, meditate on God's Word. You can meditate on what you hear. You can meditate on what you read. You can meditate on what you 
analyze, you can meditate on what you, get my breath here, <clears throat> good, got that breath, very good, yes, now if, if that's H-E-A-R-T within the palm of the hand is written, apply the word. You receive the word into your mind, then you've got to apply it, you've got to put it into practice. And God told Joshua that was what he needed to do in Joshua 1.7. Be careful to do all the laws which Moses commanded you. Do you hear that? Obey how many of them? All the laws. It's not a buffet where you choose what to obey, and leave the rest. <clears throat> he tells Joshua, <clears throat> he says, do not turn to the right or to the left. That means it's a straight line to walk. It's not the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's a straight line. <clears throat> you know why it's a straight line? Because Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. If you're in a race and Jesus is the finish line, you run, and you run straight. You don't fear to the right or to the left. You run straight to Jesus. Jesus was the spotless Lamb of God. He committed no sin. If your eyes are fixed on Jesus, if you're running to Jesus, obedience to God's Word pursues you and is true of you. During the four years I spent at Columbia Bible College, Columbia International now, I sat through chapel daily, every day of the week. During that time, I heard many messages. I only remember one of those today. The number one sermon I heard in those four years was based on the words of Mary at the wedding of Cana when she said to the servants, whatever he says, do it. The essence of what that preacher was saying was that some go to church with the hope that the preacher will say something that they didn't already know. Others want to hear something that's going to move them emotionally. There are others who go to all kinds of conferences looking for something new. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But what really matters and what godly Christians we would be if we just did what we already know. How about you? Are you doing all you are called to do? Are you doing all that you know to be God's will for your life? Now think about it. What about the heartaches that would be avoided if we obeyed God's commands regarding sexual morality. Wouldn't that eliminate a lot of heartache? What if we followed his counsel regarding telling the truth always? What if we forgave people instead of carrying around hurt feelings for weeks, months, and even years? What if we submitted to authority 
instead of rebelling against those God has put in place? What if we look to God rather than our credit card to make decisions about our spending? What if we became more passionate about character issues than external things? It has been said that this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. Because this is the book that makes all the difference. Because this book is a revelation of God and His will for our lives. This book is what will in, in, enable our faith to grow stronger in God to better deal with the challenges which come our way. So the question this morning for us is where are you in the challenges of your life? Are you standing on the promises? Many of the promises in God's Word now are just for God's children. If you are not one of God's children, I can think of some promises that apply to you. And one of them is Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. What a marvelous promise to those who do not know the Lord. And if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, he wants you to know this morning that if you will confess that you are a sinner, and we all have sinned, and if you will believe that Jesus died for you, and that Jesus rose again, that your sins will be forgiven and you can become a child of God. You can make that decision this morning, become a child of God. Now maybe you don't quite understand all of that, but as our praise team sings, there's going to be people at the back and, and they're going to have some tags on. And if you have a question about confessing sin and believing Jesus and his dying and all of that, I just don't get it. But you know it's important. You go to some of these people that will be, be in the back and, and they'll help you with that. Now, if you understand that confession and belief, um, Christian, this is a time that you just, you just, you just live for the Lord. I like those hymns. Wasn't holy, 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 great this morning? I like that. There's another hymn, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living Word of God I shall prevail as I'm standing on the promises of God. Believe you, challenges are tough. They're difficult beyond our ability, but not beyond His. Take His promises for you and cling to them. To cling to them, hold them in your heart. And then, not only the promises, but to value God's Word. You know, sometimes people have difficulties because they basically brought it upon themselves. You know, they're just where they're, all, where they're at because they made bad decisions. Well, we need to value God's Word. We need to obey God's Word. And God wants you and He will empower you to overcome temptations and trials which come your way. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation, and that word can be translated trial also. No temptation or trial has overcome you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted or tried beyond what you are able, but will provide a way of escape in order that you might come through that time. Take your relationship with God seriously. Your obedience to Him. You can be tra changed, transformed by the Word of God. It'll strengthen your relationship with God. 
If you need somebody to pray with about maybe some of those struggles, you're a believer, but you know, I just need to be closer to God more in His Word so my faith will be stronger. They'll be glad to pray with you about that. Brothers and sisters, whatever challenges that you face now or in the future, remember His words this morning. Be strong. Be courageous. Hold to the truth. And remember that you will never walk alone. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the loving God that you are. Thank you for your love for your children. Thank you for your promise to walk with us through all that we might face in this life, in this time, in this day, in this hour. God, help us to draw closer to you, to seek to know you more deeply, to cherish your word more deeply than we ever have before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.